The Garden of Eden was a majestic place. There were many, many trees. And I'm told that these trees were delightful in appearance. So I imagine them for myself, rooted and sturdy and abundant and calming and cool. Pillars at night that kept the starry canopy above Eden in place and rock-solid masts by day that reached and touched the sun. Good to sit under, good for shade and good for food and good for God because he walked among those trees as he spoke with Adam and Eve. Now in the midst of the Garden of Eden, God planted two special trees. He planted the tree of life and he planted the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And both these trees were good trees because God does not plant bad trees. The fact that Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and were not supposed to does not make the tree bad. It was a good tree. Now the fruit of the tree of life gives you eternal life if you eat its fruit. But the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil gives you the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong in the same way that God knows what is right and wrong. But there are qualifications, I'll explain. And so the question is, what does that mean practically? And so it's a little bit tricky. But let me explain how the tree of the knowledge of good and evil works by using a before and after comparison. Before Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were innocent. God decided for them what is right and what is wrong, like parents do for their children. Children, as you know, are not expected to know off the bat what is right and wrong and and this is how adam and eve were in a sense they were still minors they they were innocent and so their innocence is specifically reflected for you in the fact that they were naked but they were not aware of it just like small children are not aware of their nakedness but after adam and eve eat the forbidden fruit everything changes because their eating of the fruit is a declaration of independence from God. From now on, God will not decide for them what is right and wrong. They will decide for themselves what is right and what is wrong. You see, they wanted to be like God, even though they were not God. And if you then go deeper on the imagery... What God had really forbidden was their right to decide for themselves what was in their best interests and what was not. This right to decide God had not delegated to them. And we must fix our attention on the fact that when someone attempts to act autonomously from God, independently, that someone is trying to be God-like. Or trying to be God. Because only God can validly act autonomously. And that's something that the world does not want to hear. But let me say it again. Only God can validly and properly act autonomously. In their independence, Adam and Eve move out under the covering of their parent, God. And now... They can be held liable in own right for their decisions and actions. In other words, they, they're in no way minors anymore. A spiritual transaction has happened which makes them like adults who are now responsible for their own decisions and their own actions. And you will note that the first thing that Adam and Eve realize after eating the fruit is that they are naked. And this is specifically included to show you that they have lost their innocence. Shame has entered their world among those majestic trees. Shame has come in and now they're looking for leaves to cover up. And unfortunately for them there was no going back. They have to leave the Garden of Eden. 
And so hopefully you now have the principles fixed with me that in actual fact the eating of the forbidden fruit was an act of independence, a declaration of independence, cutting them off from God. Now let's move to some application as we reflect on these principles that we've learned. Here's the first thing we should should think of. We have the ability to choose what is right and wrong because our first parents ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was forbidden. So we have that ability coming down the generations. But our ability to choose what is right and wrong is severely tainted, affected negatively by the fact that we put ourselves first in our sinfulness above God and above others. Each one of us has selfish ambition. We want to put ourselves first in the deep recesses of our existence. We twist right and wrong to suit our own needs. And then of course you and I are not God, so we cannot ever properly discern because only God can be validly autonomous and validly autonomously decide what is right and wrong. In the simplest terms, we need God desperately, absolutely. If we want to fix things as to what is right and wrong, if we want to fix our lives, what must be reversed in our lives is our declarations of independence. You see, each one of us, as I've already said, is guilty of a declaration of independence. And I tell you, it runs deep. We love doing things our way, not God's way. Part of our autonomy is our excuse, especially nowadays, of being busy. Our excuse of busyness. It's a scourge, I tell you. And as Elder Soli Tayele said yesterday, we think we own our own time, as if it is ours to do with as we want. And because we have that attitude, because we're functioning out of independence, we do not wait on God. Because we're too busy, and too distracted, and too independent. We're not in a place where we carefully consider our ways in the light of God's word. Because why? We don't even read the word properly. We do not reflect because we're too busy and too distracted and too independent. We don't go to church. Many of us, we don't do personal prayer. We don't go to corporate prayer. We don't do quiet time regularly. We don't do Bible reading properly. Because why? We are too busy and too distracted, too independent. I think the problem that the church faces in 2023 is that we profess with our tongues that Jesus Christ is our Lord, but our actions prove otherwise. Our actions prove that we're actually independent of Him. For example, we live in fear and anxiety because if truth be told, the all-powerful Lord of hosts who controls the armies of heaven is not in control of our lives. We are. And because we're in control, we cannot have peace in the face of our enemies. We live with hate and anger and judgment and criticism and bitterness and easy offense because if truth be told, the king of love who lays down his life for sinful others, for his enemies, is not in control. We are. We live our lives beyond our means, with credit and so much more, because if truth be told, the one who had no place to rest his head in this world is not in control. We are. Our independence from God is clear for all to see, despite what we might profess. We must really just be honest with each other about it. It's clear our actions evidence the situation. 
we should be honest and consider our ways before God. Read Haggai if you have an opportunity. You see, the beautiful thing is that you and I can choose differently. We can choose to retract our declaration of independence because of the power that God gives us through the Holy Spirit. God should be first in our lives. And we must be rooted in Christ, not rooted in ourselves. Jesus, here's the wonderful thing, is our bridge back to Eden. He is our bridge back to innocence. And Jesus is the one who clothes our nakedness with righteousness. Jesus takes away our shame. And where our connection was lost by our declaration of independence, it is Jesus who connects us again to the Father and to God Himself. So I close. And I close with Jesus' words from John chapter 15 that Uncle Angus also quoted this week. And these words that Jesus speaks destroys any thought of independence. Let me read it to you. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will remain and be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. May God bless you so today. Amen.